SUSE.io makes security tools for everyone. SUSE's flat rate pricing means you can set up SCA and DAS tools for your whole team. No seat counts, no scan limits, and you never have to talk to a salesperson. SUSE integrates with all common CI/CD platforms and supports most popular package managers. And thanks to SUSE's open source vulnerability scanner, license management suite, and SBOM generation capability, you can get back to what you really want to be doing, coding in no time. Visit securityweekly.com slash SUSE. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. We just talked with Harshil Parikh about expanding security left so that it serves the business, as well as his advice on making a security champions program scale. I'm your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with John Kinsella, and it's just about time for the news. But first, we have two announcements, because we don't want you to miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. You can visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe to subscribe on any of our podcast feeds and have all new episodes downloaded right to your phone. You can also join our mailing list, Discord server, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms. Then join us April 14th to learn how to monitor your Wi-Fi network for attacks with Enzyme, a free and open source wireless intrusion detection system. Then join us on April 21st to learn how to gain visibility into your enterprise with Sysmon. Live attendees at both of these webcasts will have the chance to win a $100 Hacker Warehouse gift card. Register at securityweekly.com slash webcasts. And of course, don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical training at securityweekly.com slash on-demand. And oh, we have a lot of news this week, John. Uh, but first, I do. If, if there's any Beatles fans out there, um, I do have a, a little riff that I wanted to try and introduce, which I won't exactly sing. But imagine that I'm Ringo, who'd like, and <clears throat> I'd like to be under the sea in an octo CISO's inbox, throwing shade. <laughs> And that is my intro to ooh the kerfuffle that is Okta and their breach. There's a lot of things to go over here, uh, a lot of different paths we can take. And it's not even necessarily a strong AppSec path since it boils down spoilers to social engineering. But we do, John, talk quite a bit about communication, both hitting transparency in breach notification, transparency in postmortems that we've covered over the, the past year or so as well as the, just the communication and really good write-ups about from researchers, from developers who have found vulnerabilities. So that is definitely one of the angles that I'm foreshadowing I'd like to go down. But uh, I want to let you start us off because uh, you've been exercising uh, your, your, your brain uh, last episode, of course. You got to carry us through all the news. So let's keep that momentum going. What, where do you want to bring <laughs> us into the Okta story here? Um, you know, I'll, I'll go a tiny bit off script first and say, so, you know, I think communication <laughs> is super important. Um, but I, I, and I hope it's none of our listeners, but it might be. Um, you know, right now the focus is on Okta and the communication of that Okta is giving out to the the world about how they have been affected, if they've been affected, um, if, as people are rumored to say, a 16-year-old kid in England is, is was able to pop through their stuff. Um, the next thing for people to think about is the consumers and the users of Okta. How have they been affected? Will they be affected? Um, are they being transparent themselves? about um, where they use Okta. So I think that's something which I'm starting to, I'm starting to see signs of it sort of behind closed doors. Um, I'm, I'm not here to name names or even make rumors, but um, I, I want people to think about, okay, is my vendor, were they using Okta? If they were, where was Okta? Um, what would someone be able to get access to with that? And how do you think about that? And what do you do about it? Um, and for those of us who are using Okta, well, I'm not using Okta. For those of in the community who are using Okta, how do you ensure now that since someone has enough information to social engineer people, if that's the information which was leaked, um, mm -hmm. what what do you do with that? How do you how do you ensure and ensure that um, do you redo your training with your um, you know your your social engineer training with your, with your teams or how do you make sure that people don't get um, uh, fall down to something as a result of this? I think that the sort of two important aspects. Um, what to say about it by itself? I mean, it's it's another week. Uh, it's another thing. It's <laughs> it's. I, I don't know, man. It's 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 from. It'd be curious to hear your point of view. I'm, I'm going to try and talk a lot and, and save your voice here a little bit, but um, it would be curious on this one to hear your point of view of like, okay, um, 
uh, you know, I'm filtering out what let's leave the company names out of it. But how how do you deal with something like this? You know, it's 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 out there. It's done. It's too late now to do anything about it. We've got he said she right. said going on, but um, it at the end of the day it comes down to what what's going to either happen to me or my company or uh, my vendors, and how do I how do I mitigate that right now from the point of view where we are? It's, it's I don't know if that's on your mind at all or. Yeah, it, it definitely is, and that, that's I think the other path that I w- that was that felt more appealing to me to go down and discussing a breach like this. And I linked into an article once again from Phil Venables. We've hit I think this will be the third or fourth one in the last you know six months. This is an article though from August 2020 that's talking about insider threat, which to a large degree is what this boils down to in the sense of you know external actor but social engineering to get into you know customer support or an internal access that is privileged access that might be now used for you know legitimate access used for illegitimate purposes to use some of the language in that uh, article and I see this as partly just, once again, everyone deploy your FIDO keys because that is going to be just one of the ways that's more phishing resistant. It's going to be, it's going to make this type of attack far more difficult. And I think the other aspect is, I will touch a little bit on the Okta side. There is definitely some transparency, some communication discipline that could have been improved. But they did at least also demonstrate that they had logs, they had forensics capability that once, you know, there was pushback, there was, there was, I won't necessarily say friendly feedback, but there was feedback from the community about tell us more that Okta was able to go and say, here is more about it. Here is the specific number of customers affected. This is why we think this is the number. This is why we have confidence in this value. And being able to have that forensics capability, the amount of logs, I think is what is one of those things that you as a, any organization, speaking generally, can work on right now. Do, would you be able to reproduce this type of information in this particular scenario? And that's a good discipline to have. And then the other aspect is that insider threat, when we say, you know, least privilege for the last, what that goes back to 40 years, 50 years to Orange Book, I want to guess, one, one of those um, mm-hmm. uh Books of color from, uh, you know, come out of the DOD, NSA era. Thank you. Rainbow series. You know, there's a difference between saying privilege or least privilege access and then having your internal tooling actually enforcing it. And uh, that's one of those things that's also important Mm -hmm. in a scenario like this, as well as, I guess, the final comment there auditing what those insiders do. So rather, so in addition to just having customer support that needs to have access to customers to change an email address or update a field or something like that, you're also at least auditing what all of those actions are so that afterwards, as I was saying before, you can go back and recreate from a forensics perspective and say, this is what happens. This is what the potential exposure was. Or you can also generate alerts that says, this is an insider who's been bribed. This is an insider turned bad. Or this is an external actor who has gained the equivalent of insider access. So I think that's yeah. where I wanted to you know, exhaust my uh, observations on, on this particular yeah, that, uh, topic. You brought up one or two good points there. Um, oh, man, don't lose them. So first, it's interesting. We've had this is that's the second or third time in the last month or so um, we've had you, us, or a, 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 um, a guest mentioned the Rainbow Books. It, it's sort of interesting mm. to see those coming back. Um, the one point I want to make really quickly for our listeners, this is a really good time when you want to go check out our show notes. Mike has, I think it's nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven links on this on this story. So there's a, you know, we're just, as you can imagine with something like this, we're barely just touching the surface of it. Um, two points I want to make on the auditing thing. Um, one, as someone writing, a, you know, um, a, a SaaS product, one of the interesting things to think about from this, I'm always just like, okay, when, which things do I want to audit? I mean, I obviously want to audit if someone's modifying or deleting a record. Like those are the core things I want to, I want to be able to get some sort of a log around. Do I want to audit reads? That's maybe, maybe not. That That's sort of the interesting. Maybe I want to audit reads on sensitive things. Okay, well, what's sensitive? Um, one of the things I saw this morning, and I, I think we all know I don't like rumor mong- mongering, so I haven't had time to go back and confirm this, compare what you just said. I had heard that they weren't logging um, API get calls, so I'm not sure exactly, and that could be that could be a mistake on my part. But if that's the case, I'm not sure how how much of that you can put together, right? Because if if you are, and why do you have the audit log? It's the other part of it. 
do you have an audit log to make sure that information isn't being tampered with? Or are you actually, you know, what's the use case for that audit log eventually whenever you, if someone actually ever reads it, is are you looking at it for uh, data exfiltration? Because if that's the case, then, okay, that means you're really auditing everything in the system because anything could be used to do that. Um, and, and that's sort of interesting to think about, like what, how, what, how much trouble do I want to go to um, quite honestly, you know, back look at our, our the segment we covered in the last uh, uh, last half hour. Not just purely from a business point of view, but just in general, from data storage and all those type of things. Do I want to audit everything, or do I want to audit just what's important? Because the more I put into that audit log, the harder it is to find the needle. So um, it, it's 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 interesting to think about. Um, you know, it's it's I guess that's our homework for people who are are you know building things is. How do you make sure, obviously you don't want to fall into this octa type thing, but if you do fall into this octa type thing, um, it's really useful if you can say, as, as Mike was saying, with a, a high level of certainty, this is exactly what happened and we know you are are not affected. Um, so yeah, I uh, cross fingers for everyone that they don't fall into that, but that that's sort of the way it is. Indeed. And I have a high level of certainty. We have a lot of uh, articles to get through. So I'm going to mm -hmm. shift from there. And we have a bunch of vulns to talk about. But I think, uh, John, you grabbed an article that it probably is a better, best way for us to kick off talking about these vulns. And it is, so I'm going to give away the title, C isn't a language, and I'm going to editorialize and say, it's a lifestyle. Or for those Ted Lasso <coughs> fans, C is life, but also death. Um, so that's the best editorial I'm going to add here. It's now for up to you to uh, get us beyond uh, into some meaty details of what this article is talking oh about. Where do I go from there? Excuse me. Um, <laughs> One of these days I need to get into Ted Lasso. One of these days I need to get into Ted Lasso in all my spare time. Um, yeah, so I, I will put a um, uh, a warning on this for for our listeners who are um, don't like strong language. Uh, our friend here who wrote this blog post, um, there's all sorts of um, colorful colorful language uh, being used. Imagine me if I'm not being recorded on a podcast. It's almost how I talk. Um, this is interesting. So the, the title is definitely clickbaity. Uh, C isn't a programming language anymore, dot, dot, dot. And it takes probably about 10 paragraphs before we get down to what they think it is. Um, and what they think it is is a protocol. Um, and this is sort of an interesting idea. This, this is, again, you know, we're, we're on the deep thinking uh, articles this week. The idea here is, is basically most languages that you want to use. And the example they give is imagine if we created a language um, called, uh, what's the name he gave on it? Bouncy. Um, where'd it go? Um, yeah, ba uh, baby, baby script. script. Baby script. Yeah. Thank you. So imagine you create this fictional language. And then you want to interact with your 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 operating system. You want to load a file, right? So, what do you do? You're going to go and try to link in, you know, standard library or, or some of the uh, libc things like that. And as soon as you do that, I already said C, right? I mean that it's in the name. So you're suddenly your language. It's very difficult for any of us to write a language which is really pure and of itself. Um, I think Go is the example that comes to mind. Not sure. Low, I'm sure it must use C at a low level. But anyways, because um, if you're not using a standard library, that means if you're not using these C libraries, that means you have to go through and, and do your file system stuff um, and actually think about what that means to open a file, right? You have to be able to figure out where that file is on the, on the disk, disk, um, whatever that storage thing is. Figure out where that file is, figure out how to do buffer read on it, handle any errors about um, if you can actually read it or maybe something's going on or timing or things like that. All this low level type stuff, right? Um, that's that's why we depend upon, um, and we're not depending upon C, we're depending upon an existing, existing library. Um, if this guy wanted to be really snarky in this article, he probably could have gone and said, hey, it's a supply chain issue, right? Because C is part of the supply chain. Um, but that, that's sort of the idea. And, and what, what these things are to sort of describe through what I'm talking about there is what's called a foreign function interface um, or an application binary interface that allows you to, in one programming language, whether it be Rust or Go or, um, hell, probably JavaScript, um, any of these type of things to be able to access an existing uh, collection, well, existing library of functions in another language, in this case C, right? It's how do you get to that FFI? Or how do you create that FFI so you can access those those um, existing code base? Um, and, and that's sort of the beginning of it. But the thing is to do that, C is such a, in particular, such a machine dependent and um, a bit length dependent language, and probably also Indian dependent also, right? That 
if you are going to support um, C for BabyScript across, say, you know, my my old Intel Mac, my new ARM Mac, um, you know, a Linux box, a Windows box, uh, probably a 32-bit versus 64-bit Linux and Windows. So you suddenly start really growing um, all these different sort of versions of, of what that FFI looks like. And as we all know, as you add that complexity, you're also adding, you know, the chance of vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and that's just looking at the complex aspect of it, not alone if, if we're using Rust and we consider Rust to be a um, type safe, memory safe language, if I'm going to start importing stuff from C, you know, our, our sort of, to use the phrase, redheaded stepchild over from yonder, am I breaking that or how, you know, so there, there's definitely something I think you're losing by doing this. And they actually have an example here as I scroll through about, um, you know, what's int max um, on a 64-bit Linux machine when that code is being imported into Rust, um, and then long, long, it, it, it gets it's 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 a good read to remind you what goes on there underneath the hood. Um, but I think that's really the takeaway here is is for folks to think about. And oh God, now they got some example about um, yeah. Uh, so they have a case study near the end uh, about uh, um, the machine call jump buff uh, for um, I believe that's a jump with a buffer if I remember right. But their example is showing uh, glibc on S390 and how it deals with that. Um, some folks know I, I, I happen to know glibc pretty well after my previous life. Um, and a large portion of the code that's in there, if you look about glibc compared to nlibc, um, which is a, a used with Alpine Linux and some other um, smaller microcontrollers, uh, nlibc doesn't have all the baggage from uh, Amiga, um, uh, S390, um, all these multics, all these sort of one-off, well, maybe not one-off, but previously popular op operating systems and architectures, which, you know, PowerPC, which we no longer touch, all that baggage is in GCC, or excuse me, in glibc. So this is what you sort of have to end up dealing with. And there's all these if cases and edge cases, which are made as a result of that auto-generated code and all sorts of nastiness. Um, so yeah, this it struck a bit of a chord with me, this article, beside the clickbaity title, title, but I thought this was sort of interesting to bring up and have people think about, and not just pure AppSec, but sort of how do we run into some of these AppSec problems? Absolutely. And it's great to see, you know, just to <clears throat> emphasize a little bit that, you know, the author here, she comes from working with Rust, working with Swift. So it's a very informed uh, take on this relationship between mm -hmm. C as that protocol that interface to all these other languages because most languages do have that ability to be i forget what rust version is but it's basically i need to call into the unsafe c land i think go has the exact same thing mm -hmm. and that's where you unfortunately like you were saying you lose a lot of those type safety guarantees thread safety guarantees once you have to cross this boundary into the file system go into something that is glibc native things like that so in so in Go, it's particularly painful. I'm not sure about Rust, but in Go, once I use, um, well, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but once once you, you there's actually a flag you have to enable in, in Go to, to, to support C languages, C language linking. Once you do that, you lose a pretty good amount of stuff. You're losing some of your debugging capability. You're losing some of your um, uh, probably memory management, but I was thinking profiling capabilities. So some of the actual core things which you we really love in Go, once you start leaking, once you start linking out someone else, things get sort of not great really quickly. So it's it it is a painful thing. Um, you know, we recently, I think I mentioned on here, we recently are decided to start using a uh, open source authentication library, which isn't it's not Go native. It's written in C, C plus plus. But that means now I I broke that 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 um, blood brain barrier so to speak, and I'm, my Go code is having to link into C. Um, I seriously ponder writing that auth, rewriting that auth, porting that auth library over to Go and, and sort of open sourcing it back out to them, which is not a light thing to do. But that's sort of the level I don't want to, you know, leave my Go realm. So um, yeah, it, it's 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 sort of a thing. Uh, so yeah. But anyways, I think I interrupted you saying something. No, I think that's a great setup. So we 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 set up some of this, you know, the 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 uh, the problems with C or how to think of C. So now let's use that with that in mind. Start to talk about some of these vulnerabilities that we have on our articles as well. Mm -hmm. What you were just talking about there is rewriting and you know something that's pretty critical an authentication library 
in, back into native Go rather than from its C++. Another good candidate for such a rewrite is uh, Zlib. Now, I pulled off of the uh, open wall mailing list, uh, Tavis Ormandy, someone who's possibly familiar to many of our listeners, who finds some consequential vulns every every once in a while, uh, poking at Zlib or poking at a, a vulnerability within Zlib. And I highlighted this less about what the vulnerability is, but more about everything uses Zlib. So here's one of those examples that rather than a C-based library, this would be one of those great things to prioritize with a rewrite into a memory-safe language. Um, so I, that, that's why I wanted to throw there. I think that kind of helps us with this conversation we're having around language and perhaps even a call back to our last segment. How do we? What would be some of the factors we would use to prioritize work? So that's one of the vulnerabilities and thoughts that come to mind as we're discussing this. Yeah, I'm glad you found you listed this one. I, I was watching this thread all last week, and I, I didn't manage to read it, unfortunately. But um, my understanding is there's um, a if you give uh, malicious input to um, libz when you are deflating, right? So when you're compressing, not when you're uncompressing, if I remember right, that there's a chance for um, a, um, a buffer overrun. Um, which then you know we're we're off to the the, the, the circus so to speak, but it it's um, yeah so it's it's the there's a link in there to the patch um, for our listeners to go and dig into, but yeah it's, I'm glad you threw this one in there. Yeah, and it, that it's it's sort of the theory of just patch because Zlib is everywhere. It could be bad. So far, the risk is a little bit uncertain in the sense mm. of the the imp potential impact is high, but the likelihood maybe potentially low, just because a lot of the the, the planets must be in alignment and the moon mm -hmm. in a you know particular phase for it to be you know universally exploitable, but. Other things that it possibly are a little bit easier to exploit are some vulns in uh, some Sophos. You found an RCE, mm -hmm. I found a SQL injection of all things. Let's let's hit yours first. Yeah, they weren't happening. I don't know if this is like a quarterly release or something which came out, but uh, it seemed like there's a few articles. There was um, three. So there was my one, your one, and also there's a another one in their UTM. But anyway, so this one, we'll start off with this guy. Um, Sophos Farwell. Um, is a firewall um, sold by Sophos. Uh, and, and so in here, there's a web administration portal. Um, our astute listeners know that once you have something like a web-based portal on a firewall, we're not off to a good start. Uh, and in this case, we have a 9.8 CVSS, um, a CVE 2022-1040, um, which is both a, a chance to do authentication bypass on your lovely web-based interface and then do a remote code execution, um, which means your firewall is probably not going to be firewalling for very long. Um, I don't think I want to spend too much time on it beyond that, right? It's it's we've we've got the SQL I one you have also, and like I said, there's another one out there. So it's um, they must have been doing like a, a quarterly release or something, or maybe they did like a security um, sprint or two, and, and this is a result of it. But um, you know, it's 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 from my point of view. A web interface on a firewall is never. I, I understand we. Want, I mean, even hell, I myself right now try to make things more pointy, clicky, and security. But I, I guess we've, as an industry, we've seen that they're probably most people are not going to put as much time into the web interface as they put into the security of the firewall aspect, and that's how we end up in a situation like this. So um, it's a bit of a, a smell and a tell for me. And the first thing I'd probably try to do is ha firewall the web interface, but. Um, uh, with that, back to you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I think for me there was SQL injection, but this was, uh, honestly, I'm just going to say I, I could care less about the SQL injection these days yeah. because, and focus more on the type of article where they call out, this is the CVSS number, or here is the mm -hmm. number of results that come back from, we, we checked Shodan, and there are a million or 10 million of these, mm -hmm. or here is the number of downloads every week for this particular NPM package or this, you know, from the App Store. And th those, uh, I understand why those get put in there. They're sort of, tr they're, they're trying to give a sense of impact or a sense of broad 
uh, popularity or population that could be impacted by volumes, people that are downloading the software. But for me, when I see something like the SQL injection, and honestly, a lot of other volumes we come across, I would be really curious to see metrics along the lines of what is how what was the date of the commit that introduced that flaw? In other words, how old, how, how long has that flaw been around there? Is it a year, five years, 10 years? And also speaking, just focusing on dates, what was the last time, what was the last commit that touched that impacted file? Meaning that maybe this vulnerability existed, that file, but somebody else went and wrote some other code in there, and ostensibly they may have seen this vulnerable code, or more likely, they had some tools that hopefully ran during their automated CICD, some security tools that possibly missed what was there. And then honestly, too, just the date of the last commit to that particular repo, just to give us a sense of, is this really legacy code? And maybe not to excuse it, but to explain why we have a SQL injection in this day and age. Or was the last commit only just this week? And this is well-maintained code, which gives us a different story to to start to look into in the sense of why hasn't this, you know, why is there a SQL injection in here and it hasn't been refactored, uh, which is a little bit of a callback, I think, to our last segment about prioritizing business risks and saying Mm -hmm. we absolutely are missing a framework versus we have a framework and somebody made a mistake that slipped through. Uh, So that that type of age or or time dimension, uh, set aside my my hat and my Doctor Who preferences, that dimension in time and maybe some space would be really interesting to me to see in these types of uh, articles. Yeah. And let's let's see if I can do this without conjecturing or rumoring on on these guys. But to suddenly see a, a collection of, and again, I don't know, this could be a standard process for them, but the, the the thing I'd like people to think about is when you see a collection, multiple, um, in this case, fairly severe, but you know, in general, multiple security patches come out at once. Why? Right? Okay, if it's Microsoft Patch Tuesday, I get it. Um, right. If it's Sophos, maybe it is, you know, the, the every March, March of every year, that's when they do their security, I don't know. Um, but on the other hand, it could be uh, someone, they had some uh, turnover and they brought in a new head of security and someone said, dude, you got a patch of stuff that's been there for the last five years? Or maybe legal came and said, there's a chance we might get sued, so we need to fix these. Or There's different reasons it could be out there. Um, and I have no idea which one of those that they are, but that's something I would think about. Um, and I think that ties in a little bit. It's sort of a business um, translation of what you were just saying there, Mike, of, of you know, what's going on um i was thinking as you're saying would it be possible for the various laws we're starting to see now which are requiring disclosure and things Mm -hmm. like that to actually say not just this happened but how long it's been there but my worry is in a non-zero number of cases probably a decent number of cases people won't be able to tell how long it's been there um (laughs) fair point you know that that's not a great sign that that's that's where you are with your code, but that's um, that might be the lay of the land, unfortunately. But anyways, let's see where are we want to go next. Um, you had a story about Rust uh, and Redos. You want to maybe talk about that one a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so uh, in the spirit of uh, you know, I, I will always harp on this as just a reminder that memory safety isn't the only bad thing out there. And mm-hmm. here it was a vuln in Rust that was related to uh, basically a local DOSs from uh, if you can get a user supplied regex in there, which is is kind of cool, but. To me, actually, the less interesting aspect was there was a flaw in Rust, but was was more cool was that it was found by fuzzing. And I love the idea that more people are adopting and focusing on fuzzing. I think it's still, I, I suspect anecdotally, that it's still underutilized, that there's a big time investment in running a fuzzer and then actually finding something of security consequence or even just a bug that needs to be fixed. But Partly what it was interesting about this is the uh, author or the, the commenter who was in this, uh, who had run, ran this tool, was describing their structured approach to fuzzing and said that, you know, made the comment, 
that in this case, you know, they had only run the fuzzer for about 20 seconds before they started to get that, you know, oh, this isn't passing the sniff test. I'm going to go find something. That was really neat. And part of that was because, as they described, they were using a a structure-aware fuzzing. So rather than just being Uh. completely random and saying, I'm just going to go through the, the, the entire dictionary of possibly really just weird, strange, noisy stuff that could happen here, be more focused on what a uh, language, so to speak, of regular expressions can look like and be a bit more grammar aware to, to maybe throw in some synonyms there. And that was that approach was obviously very successful in the, since they got, you know, 20 seconds, bam, they found a uh, CVE to throw on here. So that I thought was really cool. The use of fuzzer, being smart about the fuzzer rather than just, yep, we, you know, checking the box saying, yeah, I turned on a fuzzer, but just recognizing that these tools aren't magical and they still need care and feeding for them to be effective. So that was definitely the the angle I wanted to hit on there. Love it. And the thing about it, though, is um, that requires more time still, right? Now you're not just taking a tool and throwing it in there and using it. But now you have to go, okay, I've got this big complex beast. How do I focus him down and get him to do the right thing? Um, You know, I'm pretty proud of our, uh, um, our pipeline and the testing we're doing in our unit test coverage and stuff like that. But at the same time, am I doing fuzzing? No. It's like, could I tell you when I'm going to have time to do fuzzing? Um, <laughs> right. As like, you know, the, the co-founder of a year-old startup, I, I'd love to. Um, but it's it's going to be a while. So, um, you know, am, am, am I worried about that? No. Do I think it would find something? Probably. Something bad? I hope not. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, you know, we, we've talked to at least one company in the past that was trying to make uh, the fuzzing experience mm-hmm. easier and, and, you know, more, I'll dare say, <laughs> friendly. But um, how do you, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, it's, it's unfortunately, at least from what I've seen, I'd, I'd love someone to show me something differently, but last I've seen, all the tools are still very, I don't want to say low level, but low level. There's nothing quite out there on the open source side that's plenty clicky to make this stuff a little more usable for people. Um, but I, I think almost every time we've seen them, Either one or two things are going to happen. Either it's going to burn up, burn up a lot of CPU cycles, like like we've seen in some cases where it runs for a week and yep. finds almost nothing. And then you have something like this. If you have a little bit of intelligence up front, you, you get really great results out of it or more useful results out of it. So, yeah, that's fun. Um, let's see. Where do we want to go next? Uh, let's talk about our friends over at Qualys, Log4Shell. They had a neat little uh, blog post here about... Um, uh, uh, visualizing the vulnerability and the impact of, of log four shell. So ninety um, percent of Fortune five hundred companies use Java. One million attack attempts were launched in the seventy two hours following log four J vulnerability disclosure, and thirty percent of those log four shell instances are still vulnerable. I'm surprised the numbers that low, but um, I'm guessing this is based off of the Qualys scan data. Uh, they've got a pretty good idea by now. So. Um, I'm going to say it, maybe I shouldn't, but I think you could translate that as 30% of Qualys customers are vulnerable to Log4Shell. I, I don't want to spell that out, but I think that's what that means. Um, and then it goes through the you know the aftermath of it, you know, um, 150 million IT assets, 22 million flagged phone, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's a good, it's, it's funny, we haven't seen as many of these, um, what do you call them, uh, um, uh, uh, there's a name for like a chart giving a bunch of information, but you know, it's me in my brain. Thank you, that word. At least I don't think we're seeing as many of these as we used to. They were quite the, the sort of hot thing for developers, or excuse me, designers to be generating a few years ago. But this one seems to have some decent stuff in there. Fifty percent of application installations with Log4j two uh, flagged as end of support. Great, as we were talking about in the last hour about um, uh, vul- uh, legacy applications. Uh, vulnerabilities detected in more twenty eight hundred web apps. Average remediation for 17 days, not too bad, better than I expected. Um, 22,000 attacks per week. Um, and then the Qualys numbers at the bottom, yeah. So this is against Qualys customer base. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good graphic. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add on that beside me sort of babbling on along a bit about it. <laughs> no, the, to me, the things that, that stood out were those um, that, you, that you touched on. More than you know, half the application, those installs were flagged as 
end of support. And that absolutely ties in that conversation we had last segment about how do you have that business case to get off of legacy systems? Because here was a sudden scramble to go fix vulnerabilities that are end of support. And so are you able as an organization even to set up some type of decommissioning process, decommissioning policy, so that you don't have this wealth of end of support systems that are actually out there, but legitimately earning revenue. So that's, that becomes a really mm. tough business discussion. So that, mm -hmm. that was an item they highlighted for me. And uh, like you, actually, re the remediation trend, 17 days, didn't sound terrible necessarily. This is a uh, vulnerability that was... <laughs> excuse me, that was in the news, quite popular, got a lot of attention. So which, uh, you know, I will say actually to a degree, unfortunately, helps yeah. light the fires under this must be addressed. And it took 17 days, which is better than other numbers we've seen that go that, you know, that are in the order of months, or even um, yeah. beyond a year. So it, it, it'd be fun to hear from our listeners on, you know, Discord, Twitter, um, uh, Twitch, YouTube, etc. Um, for those of you in a Java shop, other, and the reason I think it's interesting to us, I don't think of a Java shop as doing um, two-week releases, right? So that means that they're able, they, they were able to jump on this. Well, I mean, I guess if it's a, if you're doing a month release and you caught it halfway through 15, 17 days, that could be about what's going on. But um, it, it'd be interesting to hear from folks who care to share, like, what what is your release cadence if you're doing Java-based application coding? Because um, that's a fairly, fairly... Fairly good turnaround time. Um, and I, I sort of said it offhand, but let me give them a bit of credit because numbers are quite excellent. I've always thought they have. Um, Qualys has more than 10 trillion data points in their database. Six billion IPs are scanned per year um, and 75 million cloud agents. That's giving me a bit of a flashback of having to said that as a Qualys mm -hmm. employee, but the numbers are pretty great. Um, let's see. Uh, this Project Zero, I'm, I'm dying to hear you talk about this one. I did get a chance to, to dig into it. So tell us a little bit, if you can, about... a. Um, how do you get a, um, a, a kernel race in, in small periods of time, Matt? Mike, Ooh, small periods of time. <laughs> I'm going to slightly answer the question that I want to uh -oh. answer rather than the question that was asked. So uh, this is a great deep dive into low-level C, you know, going back to our C as a protocol rather than a language type of theme. And this is just explaining within the kernel just how to, where race conditions come from and how to analyze the structs internally to figure out is, you know, is, how our access is being gated. And when, you know, how, and the, the relationship between C, how CPUs can impact this as well. I want to hand wave just because we're running low on time mm. by the technical details and get to one of the other reasons I highlighted this is if you skip down to some of the charts that they have in there, they were showing some results Ooh, between pictures. Uh, pictures, exactly, on kernels on various CPUs. There were some really great data points they were showing. But in addition to those data points, they, there's this, but wait, those graphs make no sense. There's a great section that also brings some nice pictures that show, this is a very simple picture of what we would expect. Here is a picture that's a little bit closer to what a, you know, the bad situation, what a race condition might show. And here's what, you know, a, a preferred situation might show. And it's in that spirit of pictures speak a thousand words. So I mostly wanted to highlight that in when you get into very complex topics like this, low level C programming, kernel programming, it's really helpful to have these types of pictures to show just what are some timing variations between uh, the expectations of what a CPU scheduler is doing, how the code is triggering, and when you see these, you know, a green two two threads, two events starting to overlap, that's explaining how or why race conditions uh, can can happen. And I realized that was a very high level description, but I think it was helped a little bit, or I wanted to just take advantage of that just in that spirit of here is a great write-up from a communication perspective. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, two thoughts on there really quickly. It's, I mean, it's, you know, we were talking a lot about hardware stuff last year and I was super into this stuff and I started playing with it and life came along and I'm too busy right now, but um, it requires, if you're trying to do this from a hardware point of view to get um, a hardware design with the clock frequency quick enough, high enough to be able to actually catch those small level um, um, interrupts um, and, and catch those race conditions. It requires a good amount of, of, of you know, resources, right? Because you have to be able to probably go at least 2x 
the um, speed of your target that you're trying to be able to, to hit, probably more like three or four X. Um, and then the, the fun factoid for today, I was reading an article this morning, uh, scientists have now proven they believe that the theoretical max speed uh, for um, clock speed um, on any computer um, based off quantum physics will be um, a petahertz, which is a million billion clock cycles per second. And that comes down to basically how quickly can um, a, a, a medium respond back and actually uh, um, trigger off of a laser light. So. Um, they don't think there's lots of other things stopping us before we get there, but you know, at some point in time, maybe we'll have like a, um, maybe we'll see a petahertz. Probably not. Maybe a quarter petahertz CPU chip. That'd be pretty neat. Uh, quarter. That way, people can have maybe 15 Chrome tabs open rather than 12, and still have them all perform well. Uh, but one, we're, we're short on time. One final article I do want to really throw in there because we were talking about C is an article from Trail of Bits about binary security optimizations, and this is really neat because this gets into their spirit of getting rid of attack classes or targeting attack classes. And they're talking about what can compilers do that are security friendly that interrupts or in, in um, that, that's my pun as we were just talking about race conditions and whatnot that uh, inter that, that mitigates things like return oriented programming or not those types of uh, exploit techniques. And it was really interesting to see what they talk through and different optimizations that a compiler could potentially do and they evaluated the impact, showing that it was actually useful in a lot of attack scenarios. And from their results, had no effect on execution speed. So for those of us still stuck in a non-quantum theoretic CPUs, uh, we're, we're still in good shape. So that I just wanted to highlight that and um, definitely some good, very accessible reading as well. Yeah, it's... Um... I think yeah, I, I, I'm just going to say accessible and leave it at that. It, it's it's not. We've covered a lot of really um, gnarly in depth uh, articles here. There's another one we're probably not have time to touch on about firmware attacks that have been around for six years. But the nice thing about that trail of bits one is yeah, it, it's readable and accessible. So um, our listeners can start there this week. How about that? About that. That sounds good. Uh, speaking of, yeah, we probably need to to wrap up. Any we can throw the uh, the firmware article on for next week, or just throw that out for homework for listeners. Any other homework you'd want to throw their way while we're uh, stacking things up, John? I, I think we've got them pretty busy at this point. So um, hope everyone's staying safe and insane, and uh, um, looking forward to talking to everyone next week. Absolutely. Looking forward to also saying thank you to everyone first for joining us. Thank you, John, once again for joining us as we talk through all these articles. Uh, please subscribe, give us a like, check out the show notes, and uh, go listen to the rest of the Duran Duran discography. It's great. And with that, we'll see you next week on Application Security Weekly.